It is time to talk deer. Deer Talk Now. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Schmidt, Deer in Deer Hunting's Deer Talk Now podcast. Today we have a really special day again, but I just want to point this out right now. It's only, if you live in Florida, it's only 132 days till bow season. Can you believe that? If you live in Wyoming, it's 167 days. And for us, that's a little bit longer, 184 days. Today we are joined by, I'm calling him. I don't know if anybody's given him a moniker yet, but this is my moniker. So you can, you can attribute it to me. North America's most complete sportsman, Brad Fenson. Brad, thank you for joining us. He's in his home office there in Alberta. Brad, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dan. Pleasure to be here. And always fun to talk about deer. That is something that you and I obviously hold a great affinity for. Um, but not only just deer hunting, you do it all. You do everything. I know you, you do a lot more than I do as far as you, you bird hunt, you deer hunt, you moose hunt, you bear hunt. And you manage to all, you do it all there from your home base in Alberta. And uh, tell everybody a little bit about how did you, how did you, st- how did you get into all of this stuff? You know, basically the reason I got into this stuff is because I was born in the right part of North America. That's the, the easiest way to explain it. Western Canada is a playground for the outdoor enthusiasts. So I've lived in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. I live in Alberta currently. And uh, the property that we have, I have everything here from whitetails, mule deer, black bear, moose, and elk that come right through our property. In Alberta, we have very liberal seasons where we can hunt most species every year. You know, you can buy an elk egg across the counter and shoot a three-point bull or bigger in most zones. Uh, Where I live, I can hunt moose every year with uh, general tag with archery equipment. That's yeah, just, that's just crazy. I can't. I mean, we've talked about it, and you yeah. said, "Well, today I'm going moose hunting, or today I'm going elk hunting, today I'm going deer hunting." I just can't wrap my head around it. And you don't have a. I mean, you don't have an enormous property. How many acres do you have? We have forty-two acres. Forty-two acres, and you can oh. do all of that on forty-two acres. Yeah, we can do it here uh, because it's a smaller property. Animals come and go, but we have large tracts of crown land, which is public land in the states, where we can go out and hunt. You know, moose hunters would head for. Or the bush country to, to hunt moose and make it an experience and an, an adventure. Where we have forest forest fringe areas in agricultural uh, joining up, the elk herds are ridiculous. You know, they're always trying to reduce elk herds in part of the province where they give out extra cow tags. And those seasons will run right into late December or sorry, January. So there, there's lots of opportunity to hunt here. The growth seasons run till January 15th. Our waterfowl opens. Uh, September 1st, our archery seasons for most big game. If you want to head to the North Country, open August 25th. So lots of opportunity to, to hunt. And uh, tell the listeners about the deer. See, I just had my, that's my Canada accent right there, about, um, but it's a Wisconsin, it's a Wisconsin version of it. Um, yeah. t- tell the listeners about your deer situation in Alberta specifically. You have both muleys and whitetails? Yeah, we do. Uh, we're blessed with a diversity of habitats, is what I tell people. Uh, Southern Alberta is, you know, prairie, and it uh, lends itself very well to mule deer country and antelope, and the rivers and creeks and draws have excellent habitat, excellent cover, and they, they, they flourish there. There's quite a few whitetails there in the bigger river bottoms as well. Get into central Alberta, the prairie turns into what they call parkland. So there's a lot of aspen, a little bit of white spruce, uh, more tree cover. Uh, and there's heavy agriculture in that area. When you get through the parkland, you get to the boreal forest. As you go west, you hit the foothills and mountains. So it, uh, it's very diverse, but the whitetail lives everywhere. You know, we have whitetails uh, in the mountains. We have them in the foothills. We have them on the prairie. We have them in the boreal forest. They go all the way up to the Northwest territories. And crazy as it seems, uh, They've actually recorded them up uh, in the Arctic. They've been gone all the way up the Mackenzie River and been seen all the way up through in the Northwest Territories, uh, up where you'd expect to find all sheep and caribou. So that's one thing I want to point out. I'm actually going to jump ahead here. We're going to talk about Canada in general. Um, You know, I think for most hunters from the States who think about Canada, they think about huge bucks, and that's where you go if you want to kill a big buck. Um, 
and they say, oh, it must be nice if you live in Alberta, you know, that's, oh, it must be nice. You get to hunt these big bucks. Well, here's, here, you know, I am always crunching those numbers. Here are the numbers. So um, you can kind of compare this. I looked it up in the Deer Hunters Almanac. Alberta is home to about, you guys measure things in hectares, which is about twice as many. One hectare is like two point something acres. Yeah, the hectare is, uh, <clears throat> I, th- I think it's 2.46 or something. 2.46. Well, I con- I converted it to acres. Alberta's got about 84 million acres of woodlands and about 260,000 deer. Right. That's, that's it. And um, Alberta hunters, your success rate is about 15%. So of the of the hunters that hunt, I think they kill an average of, you know, I think it's like 60,000 deer or something like that. Well, if you put that anywhere in the states and try to, it's any state with a lot of woods, <clears throat> half the amount of woodlands, and the percentage is higher, 30, 30 to 35, even 40% success rate in the states on getting a deer. So it's not that easy to shoot shoot a deer in, no. in Canada. No, our densities are extremely low compared to what you'd be used to in almost any state. You know, our deer, are our, our biggest struggle, we have excellent habitat, but we never, ever get the carrying capacity because of Mother Nature. So we have these terrible winters that come along. Like this year, there's going to be, fortunately, deer loss in a lot of areas of Alberta and Saskatchewan because there's snow drifts that are 10, 12 feet high. Oh, my gosh. It was now, that bad. Yeah. I mean, I was out last night clearing snow again. We had a snowstorm yesterday and had uh, almost a foot of snow dumped on us. Heavy, wet snow. Um, but the problem is we had it all winter. We just kept, kept getting more and more, and it would drift and blow, and sometimes you get layers of ice when we get rain in between and it's just really hard for the deer to navigate they have to have uh, wintering yards set up and their trails pounded down and hope the predators don't get on them because they're vulnerable and if they don't yard up with other deer they, they usually don't make it what is the situation um in alberta specifically for gray wolves uh we have lots of wolves uh, and and always have um our coyotes are terrible on deer as well, uh, but our animals have always lived with wolves. You know, when wolves were reintroduced to the lower 48, uh, your animals were naive is what I tell people. They didn't know what they were facing. It was a different predator, a different animal, they're very efficient. And, uh, but ours, ours were born and raised here. They've always had wolves and they're, they're pretty effective at evading them. You know, they still eat their fair share, but uh, they know when to hit the panic button and get out of there if they need to. Can you hunt wolves uh, where you're at? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, as a resident, I can shoot as many as I want. Really? What's yeah. the uh, overriding sentiment, just being a lifelong Canadian w- w- with other hunters, is it something you just learn to live with? I mean, obviously you have a lot more land, a lot fewer people. You don't have to worry about those types of conflicts. You know, wolves are... Uh, they're part of the ecosystem. There, there's likely some hunters that have disdain for them, but uh, the average hunter just, uh, you know, we're we're all part of it. Everything's managed. Uh, most of the the public lands in Alberta are trapped with registered trappers, like registered lines. They have specific areas, and our trappers here are pretty good at targeting wolves. I've got a couple of friends that uh, go after them real hard. And, uh, a couple of them have caught several hundred wolves in their career. Wow. That... So they're good at it. They're efficient. And, uh, you know, with, uh, I've got several friends that are serious deer hunters as well that spend a lot of time in December, January, and into early February trapping coyotes and wolves. And they take a pile of them. It's great recreation in the winter. You know, we've got short days. There's not a lot of sunlight. Get out there and hunt or trap wolves or both in combination and being outside every day is pretty great way to extend your seasons that's a neat thing and especially uh you're doing that type of predator management i know we do a lot here with coyotes and and other things i mean there's certain states with got issues with bobcats and and mountain lions even you get out to the the western states wyoming colorado those places um i think what's really neat about just knowing you personally 
is you're about as old as me, I think, and I, you have two little girls, and you're bringing them up into this lifestyle. Tell the listeners a little bit about how that's going. Well, it's going great. I do have uh, twin girls that will be, uh, there's three right now, they'll be four next month. And they, the best way to put it is they love anything outdoors. So I had the side by side out last night with the blade on it to move snow. And both of them had to be there with me. So we were out, cleared the driveway, moved all the snow. And you now in the, in the winter time, if you need a break, go outside. We go hit the trails. We look for shed antlers. We go bunny hunting. We snowshoe rat, snowshoe hares, right? That's right. Yeah. We got snowshoe hares on our property that are pretty pretty good on the on the table. So we go out every once in a while and get some groceries from the backyard. But uh, they come along on duck and goose hunts. We put them in the blind, and you know they they get upset if they're not the ones out retrieving the birds. <laughs> and they help put out the decoys and pick them up. And if we harvest the moose, elk, or deer, cut it up in the shop. They're there to help. They want to help wrap it and they put their own little pictures on the packages to identify what things are. So that's what we refer to as game night at Benson's. Yeah. Game night. Game, game night, night is packaging meat. Yeah. <laughs> Processed meat as a family. That's pretty and then awesome. They, they, they eat it all too. You know, I did a Korean snow goose legs the other night and both of them at three years old ate two full legs and thighs and they were asking why I didn't make more. And so, most guys do not, I mean, I hate to say this, I've never snow goose hunted, but most guys don't even keep snow geese, which I think is a shame because I know you can turn anything into something delicious. Well, to me, it's all part of respect for the animal you harvest. It's like deer. I've been in a lot of places where people, I've been in deer camps with people that say, we don't like deer. My family doesn't like deer. And I think you were in some of them. Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, within five days, Basically, I cook a whole deer in camp, do different things, and everyone's asking if we can help that deer together to take it home. So part of it's an education. Cooking wild game is not the same as cooking domestic meat. Uh, it's very lean. It, uh, you don't want to overcook it. It cooks way, fa way faster. So, you know, I know we share a lot of that in deer and deer hunting. It's, uh, it's important to me. I know it's important to you. And uh, sharing those traditions with other hunters benefits all of us the more of us that have that deep appreciation for wildlife and all aspects of it uh helps ensure that they're always going to be there because you know what it's like to be to have dear near and dear to your heart like it's a big part of your life it uh, it helps define you absolutely and you you embrace the lifestyle man Hey, there's that sound again. We know what that all means. It means we're going to thank one of our sponsors. Today's episode of Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point and the all-new Nitro 505, the fastest crossbow in the world. With speeds of up to 505 feet per second and 227 foot-pounds of blistering power, the Nitro 505 is the fastest crossbow on the market and the most powerful crossbow ever built by 10 Point. I have not shot this crossbow yet. I am going to later this year, but my buddy Brad Fenson has. You might have already seen the videos on our YouTube page and other places on deer and deer hunting. Brad is reporting that this crossbow has a perfect balance of reverse draw power in a platform that is unmatched in its ability to produce speed and power. The Nitro 505 is equipped with the newly designed RX-8 cam system, a two-stage zero creep S1 trigger, that delivers a consistent, crisp three and a half pound pull and the easy cocking and decocking systems that dealers recommend most, the AccuSlide. Check them out today at a 10 point dealer near you or go online for more information at 10pointcrossbows.com. For the listeners who aren't aware, Brad has joined the Deer and Deer Hunting TV staff. Uh, field staff this year starting this year on pursuit channel saturday night deer camp you're going to be getting i mean i know we've done a lot with brad in the past brad's a regular presence now you've read his articles in the magazine i'm sure you've seen his videos online especially the butcher shop videos we're going to talk about that here in a little bit but not not just his family brad embraces this lifestyle 
full on. So, Brad, we're going to talk just a little bit about deer hunting. I got a couple of things. I would love to talk to you all day. I know you don't have time for that. Um, but the first uh, segment here would be we're going to continue to talk about deer hunting specifically. And I'm going to give you a question, but I get to first mute my phone because that just went off. Um, I'm going to I'm going to chum the waters because I get to answer the question first, but mine's going to be real brief. So the first question I have is uh, you, the three favorite places outside of home that you can go hunting for just a good experience. And then I'm going to follow that up with your most adventurous deer hunt. But uh, for the my three favorite places, and you can't say the same ones because I know you would. Three f- favorite places would be North Central Nebraska. You know where I'm talking about. Um, that's that's one. Uh, Northeast Wyoming would be two. And anywhere in South Texas would be three. Just for a, a great experience to go deer hunting. Now, I'm going to allow you to answer that. Now, when, I, when you answer this, I want you to think in terms of the average guy or gal they just want to go on a cool hunt that's not in that's not in their home state or province. Right. So for me, it would be hard not to put Saskatchewan on the list. I still love going over there. It's a neighboring province. I always enjoy the deer hunts there. They're they're adventuresome. You never know what you're going to see in terms of antlers. There's, there's always the chance of taking that trophy of a lifetime. Uh, second one. Um, I do enjoy Nebraska, and I know you said I couldn't use the same one. <laughs> I could tip some over to Oklahoma, but Nebraska is a special place. It, uh, you know, when you buy a deer tag there in certain areas, you can use it for mule deer or whitetail. It's a tough question because, for me, my my favorite deer hunting spots aren't necessarily about the deer; it's about the people. Right. So that that's what makes this this question tough. It. Uh, I've also hunted Wyoming, of course, and Colorado, and South Dakota's been fun, too. South Dakota's yeah. a neat one because that's an over-the-counter state. It is, and there's lots of opportunity. You know, there, there's some good deer there, lots of opportunity. It's it's a fun place to hunt. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let up on you. You tell me, what is the most adventurous, and now this could be whitetail, mule deer, whatever. What's the most adventurous deer hunt you've ever been on? most adventurous like mm. as far as just the entire taking in the sights the the scenery um the maybe a spot and stock deal or just something that you thought was just beyond cool well i'd have trouble not throwing out the uh the hunt we did on deer and deer hunting television in nebraska where we pushed a buck around in the sand hills and the running, the running, sh- the running shot episode, right? The running shot episode, which you know was controversial in itself because it was a moving deer, but uh, you know it was cold, it was windy, it was challenging, uh, and we just stuck stuck with it and kept going and kept going and created our own opportunity. We didn't give up when it looked like that deer had left and was gone miles away. He had to think like a deer, but he circled back into a you know a productive little honey hole within his home range, and we anticipated that and uh, basically bumped him out from below us. We were so tight to him we couldn't even see him. So it, that was a very interesting. It was adventuresome, but it was also rewarding because we figured things out and continued to go on the fly and made everything work, including the shot at the end. That was, a, that was an awesome hunt. If you haven't seen it, just look at our YouTube page. You can find it there. It was called the, I can't remember, it was called Running Shots with Brad Fence and something like that. But let's talk about that for a second, Brad, because next to Mark Kaiser, you two guys, like I said, are, are if I want a deer dead, it's going to be one of you guys. It's going to be, it's going to be Brad or it's going to be Mark. And especially in that situation, I was so impressed not only – at your composure, because I kind of freak out, I get excited. We That's how I grew up hunting. We grew up hunting deer drives. I don't know if that's legal up by you, but we did it. It is. That's how we hunted. And you had to learn. We learned by shooting cottontail rabbits. That's how you learn how to hit a running target. And today, I think that's a lost art slash skill. And I don't, I don't find it, you know, unethical at all. 
if you know what you're doing to shoot a running deer, if you can see Brad do it, pretty dang impressive. Yeah, and I, you know, I took some heat from it because there are people nowadays that say you should not shoot them unless they're standing still, broadside, and it's. Uh, you know, I had somebody that's a hunter ed instructor write in a letter complaining that I did this and promote it. It's not for everyone. And I, you know, don't do it if you've never practiced. I have to say that I'm very fortunate living where I do. I shoot the ridiculous number of birds and I love my bird hunting. They're all moving targets. They're at different ranges. They're going different speeds with the wind and figuring all that out to be effective and still place a pattern of steel shot on the front third of them means you have to be accurate and consistent. I find shooting moving targets like a deer or a moose or an elk, uh, it doesn't change a whole lot. To me, it's intuitive. I know where to put the crosshair. I know how I have to keep moving with the animal as I squeeze the trigger. And uh, I feel like I'm kind of lost in the generations. We had many Outdoor writers talk about the best thrill in their hunting career was walking up a big deer, putting it up, and shooting it on the run. And then we've gone through phases where that's frowned upon by most of the hunting community. And if you shot a deer on the run, you're unethical. Like there's no, there's no debate about it. They just call you out on it. But I think there is room for it. But I, you have to prepare, you know. And if you live in an area where you have deer drives, the only way you're going to shoot a deer is if you and hit them on the move. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Like you said, it's not for everybody. Just just for the same thing where you have Western hunters who are used to shooting long ranges. You know, you, you go out to, you know, Montana or even Wyoming or Colorado or some of those places. If you can't shoot 400 yards, especially for a guy who's grew up hunting where a 150-yard shot was a long shot, 200-yard shot was a long shot, I'm not going to take a 400 yard shot if I'm not comfortable with it. Just along the same lines, I'm not going to, well, I am, I am capable of hitting a running deer, but I'm not going to same thing with, and we're going to talk about crossbows. I'm not shooting a hundred yards with my crossbow either. So, I mean, there are, there are certain things where it's a judgment call and that you have to, you basically, you got to get that skill set before you start throwing lead. I don't, I don't, I don't condone just taking running shots if you've never done it to, you know, oh, I'm going to take a flyer and see if it works type of thing. Same with the long range stuff, Dan. I mean, we are we are blessed. If we could go back and talk to our grandfathers and tell them what we have for optics and range finders and binoculars and calibers and bullet designs, they would be just dumbfounded at the advantage that we have nowadays. Uh, we've shared a camp where we shot long range where you can pick up your binoculars, range something, turn your turret, and bang, bang the gong at 500 yards, 600 yards. The problem is simplifying technology doesn't mean that you can keep your composure and do the right thing when it comes time to shoot an animal at that range. You're not on a bench, you're not in a chair, you're maybe laying behind a pack. You gotta practice all that stuff. You gotta practice your breathing, your composure, your your trigger skills are number one. And if you don't do that, uh, shooting over a hundred yards is tough. So yes, you can shoot deer at four and 500 yards, uh, with the right equipment, it needs to be practiced. But to be honest with you, I've shot things at greater distance, but I still, a hunter in me wants to get as close as possible. To me, that's all part of the hunt. And uh, when we were out in Oregon hunting mule deer, shooting some new equipment that was available, I still ended up shooting my deer at not, not terrible range. That was one of my favorite adventures out there in Oregon. You were pretty excited. Like I had never seen you do cartwheels, but I thought you were part of the U S gymnastics team. <laughs> that's a, that's a mental image right there. That's a mental image. Me, Dan Schmidt trying to do a cartwheel. No, that was just, I had never, now I, you know, I had a bad moment there. I came home with blood clots in my legs, but that was yes. an unbelievable adventure up and down yes. those mountains, seeing everything mule deer. And you, you shot like, didn't you, like, fill every single tag you had? You had, like, turkey and uh, grouse or something, some kind of upland birds? Yeah, I shot rough grouse and California quail <sighs> and chuckers and Hungarian partridge. Uh, I shot my deer. I forget what day it was, but I had two or three days. So I I do that in any deer camp. 
You know that. Oh, I know that. If I tag out, there's other availability and the outfitter allows it. I'm out doing something. We, when we go to Nebraska, if I harvest a deer, I'm out hunting prairie chickens and pheasants and turkeys and ducks. And, you know, it's, it's life is what you make it. You're in a unique spot. There's new opportunities. There's maybe things you don't have at home or greater densities. Why not? Why not go? One of the best adventures was out at Goose Creek Outfitters with Scott and Kayla Fink. Uh, Brad, I had never seen a prairie chicken. How many days did it take you? It took me, th- took you three days to get me to kill one. Um, Brad is, a, Brad was limited out basically before I even tried. And I did get one, but it was a gimme. It came right into my, it basically flew right into my lap. But th- that was, heck. and we shot mallards. Uh, I think we shot some other ducks. Uh, I did not get a pheasant. I think you got a couple pheasants. Um, it's incredible. But that goes to your point of learning about the different, game and becoming accustomed to accustomed to being able to make the shot or get close or what do what you need to do to make that happen yeah and that's always intrigued me about any type of hunting i mean with the first time i went to the sand hills i watched those uh greater prairie chickens and sharp hills found out where each of them like to be up on the hills where they can watch in these little bowls out of the wind where the some maybe some rose bush or something for them to eat there and then you strategically hit those where you're not coming straight at them. And uh, the more time I spent out there, I saw that they had morning and evening flights where they would fly off the hills to areas to feed. I think that's how you got your bird is we actually shot some of them because you pay attention to all the details and put it together as a plan. And uh, once you do that, it's no different than deer hunting. You can be successful you can be a successful grouse hunter when you're deer hunting by pay attention to where they are, what they're feeding on, and where they go, and maybe come back and enjoy that later. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now you're getting me hungry because you're talking about those those grouse and their fabulous teeth. That's the next topic. But before we get to that, talking about people getting all bent out of shape about running shots and this and that and the other thing, shooting too far, whether it's with a muzzle loader or a crossbow or even a regular bow. I have a question for you. Do you think North American hunters, and I'm going to say that to, to be all inclusive, have we become too soft? I mean, have we become too sensitive to like, well, no, it's got to be this way or that way? Um, I don't know if it's soft. I mean, whenever there is a running shot involved, there's only a handful of people that reply. So, in my mind, there's others that are probably saying you should do that. And there's others that are, I remember when I did that. I grew up shooting deer like that. I remember, you know, reading Outdoor Life and hearing the stories of shooting running deer as the best part of the deer hunt. I think we also have hunter ed instructors that uh, found that message home is, Wait for that ethical broadside shot. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially as a young hunter. So I would never diss anyone for giving that message out to new hunters and people without experience. It's still my preferred shot, but you don't always have that. On the other hand, if you're a first time hunter and a deer is running across the prairie at 150 yards, I don't think you should shoot at it. You've probably never shot at any running game, shot at a flying bird, and maybe shot a couple of play targets. But if you do have that experience, um, you know, the opportunities are there. It's not like it's illegal to do it. It's just that our community feels that sometimes, sometimes it's unethical. But the ethics come with the individual. And that also comes with their experience, their knowledge and ability. So if you do practice it and you become very efficient, I still think it's an ethical shot. I agree with you. And uh, the, those one, things have to meld together. I agree with you, Brad. What, one thing that I would say is I think the difference is as we get older, you know, we're a generation removed from one or two generations removed from from families who lived through the Depression, who basically had to, if you didn't take that shot, you weren't coming home. There, there was no chance for you for coming home with meat. Do we have to do that today? No, we don't, but you're still a hunter and you still have to get in predator mode. And if you're a good enough hunter and you have that kind of experience, on the other side of the coin, 
When you talk about first-time hunters, absolutely not should they be taking that shot because I think that goes to the whole, if we flip this to the equipment um, discussion, how many times do you see people, I see so many posts on social media, somebody wounded a deer, didn't find it, they're, they're, they start blaming the broadhead. They start blaming the bow. They start, I've never had a problem shooting an expandable broadhead. Never. I mean, I've never had, I've never blamed my equipment because that's something that you train yourself is you are waiting for that shot placement, you know, with archery equipment. And when I say archery, that's anything, crossbow, regular bow, longbow. And I think I think a lot of it has to, you know, there's little bits and pieces into all those categories. So that that kind of comes down to your experience, how much experience you have out in the field. Yeah, and I've got I set my own personal goals. I shoot firearms and bows every month of the year. I don't practice the week before I go deer hunting. I actually shoot year round because the more trigger time you have and the more time on the archery range. Even if your window of opportunity for that shot is quick and small, you should be better prepared for it. And uh, I think that I'm a better shot overall with anything because I shoot on a regular basis. You know, I, I just did a mountain goat hunt and I shot three times a week before I went. I practiced shooting at all a variety of ranges right out to 500 yards because wow. I was told that's what I might have to do. So, you know, it was uh, minus 25. And that could be the conditions you're hunting in at some time. So why not get out there and practice it and see if you can do it. Take your gloves off and shoot. And uh, when that opportunity or that situation arises and you're out hunting, it might not be for a few years. You know you can do it. And you know your equipment can do it. I've personally seen you do that, obviously, in deer camp. And what has really impressed me is with... Now, I know that you primarily shoot 10-point crossbows, but I've seen you with a crossbow... And when you, you've been practicing, where I would say, yeah, good enough, you know, a circle like, yay. You've been sitting there, sitting in camp while everybody else is eating lunch or taking a nap, dialing that thing down to where you've got it to a quarter. And so I know that for sure that when you make that, when you take that shot, that thing's dead. I know I know the animal's dead. If, Bra if Brad shot, the animal's dead. And that that is a testament to that practice and knowing your equipment. So I'm going to jump ahead. We're going to, we're going to jump past the food. We're going to save that for last. We're going to talk about crossbows because I know that you are basically the guy in North America that's writing about crossbow hunting, that's doing crossbow hunts all over the place. Let's talk about just the tool itself. Why did crossbow hunting get to where it is now? Because it was, I know other, all these states have allowed it, but in your view, you've, you've tracked this now for over 20 years. Why is crossbow hunting so much more popular today? This is a theory, but I'll give you a, give it my shot to explain it. Our society is so busy. Most people don't have time to dedicate to archery. When I, I am also a vertical bow hunter, and uh, when I hunt with a vertical bow, I shoot every day. And that's how I hone my skills to make sure that I'm effective. But I think that society is just so busy that the average hunter doesn't have the time to get out and practice. In comes the crossbow. You can be more efficient. I'm not saying you can do it without trigger time because you can't, but you can pick up, if you if you take the time to sight in your equipment properly, know what it does at different ranges, you can set it down for a month and then pick it up and practice for a night and go hunting and still be successful. That's very hard to do with a vertical bow. So I think the crossbow is a function of our society and uh, creating something that is effective with the amount of time we have to practice with it. And I know that that's true because I know a lot of archers that shoot vertical equipment also have told me recently, recently that they bought a crossbow and their, their reasoning is I haven't had the time. Like, you know, it didn't work for six months. I got a job now. I've got to take full advantage of this time here. I don't have time with family to practice with my bow. I'm buying a crossbow because I'm not missing out on deer season this year. That all makes sense. And you know what? Good for them to realize if they haven't had the time, and 
they don't want to wound a deer, they don't want to take a chance on a special buck that might show up, that they use the tool that's best suited to get the job done. That's what I think a lot of it is. Um, you know, we, we're allowing people to start archery hunting at younger ages. Again, they're introduced at a crossbow at a younger age because in many jurisdictions, you have to draw 40 pounds in order to hunt with a vertical bow. And most young hunters just aren't capable of doing that. So they're getting introduced to different tools at an earlier stage of their hunting career, and they like them. Like, we, we already know that hunters are brand loyal because of their experience on their first adventures, on their first hunts. You know, if you have a, a, a browning rifle and shoot your first deer with a browning, you're going to want to have a browning rifle for the rest of your life. If it's a Remington, they're gonna, you're going to be Remington or a Mossberg. And you can create that following by what people use when they're most impressionable. And that's what's happened in the archery community is more people are starting off with crossbows and it's, uh, you know, they want to stick with it. So we see more and more opportunities opening up. There are a lot of misconceptions about crossbows. Like, I know that the vertical guys just, they're always taking a poke at me because they don't want to see crossbows in their seasons, right? Well, they, they claim it's the best poaching tool around. And I always roll my eyes and I'm like, anything you shoot with an arrow, you have to give it 20 minutes to an hour to wait and then trail it somewhere. That's not poaching. You need something you can shoot. And most of the time it goes bang really loud and then grab it and run. So it's not a great poaching tool. Are they a hundred yard uh, piece of equipment? Certainly. They can shoot targets at a hundred yards all day long. Are they ethical to shoot game with at a hundred yards? Absolutely not. I mean, I shoot, uh, I did some testing with my crossbow to shoot a hundred yards. And I was shooting a fast modern crossbow that a hundred yards, my arrow dropped 96 inches. Oh man. Okay. You know how much stuff you have to equate <laughs> for like overhanging limbs, uh, different wind currents or that deer taking half a step in the time it takes for your arrow to get there. So there is misconception out there. I have shot more things at greater distances with my vertical bow than I have with my crossbow because I paid attention to what's going on. You know, I hunted deer on, on nights when it's dead still. And I shot a buck once at 36 yards with a super fast crossbow and spined him because he heard it and almost ducked the arrow. Right. That taught me a lesson. You know, if I'm hunting, one of the, the, the best four point buck I've ever had a chance to shoot was in Missouri. And he was at 60 yards on a dead calm night and I passed him up. I, ethically, I couldn't shoot him because I, I knew he was going to hear it and jump the string and who knows where the arrow is going to end up. So I let him go. He did come in the next day at 21 yards, but he dropped his antlers overnight. <laughs> <laughs> That's an eight pointer. Story. That's an eight pointer for everybody east yeah. of the Mississippi. Um, they... So you know, I also had an episode on deer and deer hunting when I shot a buck at forty six yards, mm -hmm. but it was breezy. It was windy. The deer never heard the shot. You watched it. It didn't react. So part of crossbow hunting is also knowing your equipment, knowing it makes a little bit more noise, and knowing that the environment and what's going on around you plays a bigger role in what your range is. Some nights my range is thirty yards. Sometimes it'll be 50, but I've never shot at anything beyond 50 yards. I can't say anything, but I agree with what you're saying. But I will add this. <clears throat> Crossbows have brought more people into bow hunting. Again, it is bow hunting than anything else. It has caused more people to stay within bow hunting, retaining. We always talk about recruitment, recruitment, recruitment. I've always said retainment, retainment, and retainment, and that's why we see a lot of older hunters. My dad will be 87 here next week, and he's still hunting because of crossbow. There's there's all sorts of people, but then you know you get into the arguments. Well, you know you should have a permanent disability or blah blah blah. They should have their own season. No, what what gives? You know, th we were having the same argument. I wasn't because I wasn't here. But uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s with compound bows, you know, that newfound, newfangly compound bow was a lot easier than a recurve. And it, it was something that was always going on. I say you with a crossbow, you have to kill via hemorrhaging with a broadhead. 
it's like you said i'm okay you, you talk about a poaching tool i will whoever wants to say that i will get i will rent a minivan we're going to drive down the road up here in wapaka county where there's hundreds of deer every single night and i def i'm i defy you to kill a deer out of that vehicle with a crossbow good luck um, cocking a crossbow shooting it through a vehicle however you however you want to describe poaching i can personally shoot my matthews just as good you know at 30 or 40 yards yeah can i shoot, shoot a, cro a crossbow a little bit farther yes i can but i think that's all beside the point um people you know what what's your response brad to people who say well yeah okay if you're going to use crossbows then you should have your own season or they should not be in the regular archery season, which is like three months in most places. I think that's a dangerous statement to make because if you look at the number of crossbow hunters that are coming, you know, the longer the crossbow hunters are allowed in any jurisdiction, the more their numbers grow, which becomes part of the overall argument. But when archers overall say they should have their own season, what's going to happen is you got to be careful what you wish for because let's say you have a 60 day archery season now you really want departments to split it up into 30 days for vertical bows and 30 days for crossbows and then do you have to pick you know can you hunt both or you know i think it's more that we have to stay united as hunters you know the we don't want the rifle hunters to complain that the bow hunters get the first shot at all the the bigger bucks so we should be first where everyone can go out or the debate continues all the time. We need to support each other no matter what we do. If we were short of deer and there wasn't enough for everybody, that would be the problem. But in most cases, it's tough to find access. And once you do, you lock it in, you hunt it, and have your spots to go to. It's not like you have crossbow guys coming and taking away access that you've built for years. I mean, I know a lot of people hunt public ground. That's different again, but... I think public ground means managing your hunt for yourself and knowing that other people are going to be there. So it's a question that uh, that makes me sad, to be honest with you, Dan, because our fighting amongst our own tools within the trade is seen by the antis and used by them too. So, I mean, the last thing we want is for people to say bow hunting is not ethical. You know, are you kidding me? cutting a deer, making it hemorrhage and bleed and die out that way, we shouldn't allow that. I mean, it sounds terrible. So we always should be cognizant of what we're saying, what the message is, and support each other as hunters. I'm not saying that just because I like to hunt with a bow, a crossbow, a muzzle or a rifle. You know, when you we started this off, you said, Brad's the kind of guy that hunts with everything. I do. Any opportunity that's out there, I'm going to use it to stay in the field longer. So I hold no malice against anyone that does shoot long range, even though I prefer to do it up at close range. Uh, if they can get out there and make it happen, do it ethically and practice doing it, good for them. Same with vertical bow hunters, same with crossbow hunters, same with muzzleloader hunters. You know? uh, and where they're allowed handgun hunters, everyone has their place. We might not agree with it. We might not do it ourselves, but always ask yourself, what's the real problem? What's the real issue? Is there not enough deer? Is, uh, you know, do we want to start plowing through the stuff to see what wounding rates are and stuff like that? I don't think we want that opened up. So stay united. Uh, we have enough enemies without becoming enemies amongst ourselves. Amen. Because that's one thing I, the one thing I say is, some people say we have enough hunters. No, we don't. We don't have enough hunters. I there's str there's strength in numbers. I want more hunters. And the other thing is, here are my tags. Here here are your tags. This is the season length. Have a nice day. Yeah. Do it however you want to do it, and do it ethically. Amen. Okay, Brad. I'm going to switch very quickly because I always promise the listeners we're not going to do these marathons for podcasts and this was a good one but i'm going to try to pin you down here on another question first of all have you shot any of those new 10 points yet this year uh, yes i have which one do you know which one you've shot i shot the nitro 505 that's like 505 feet per second right 
Yeah, I mean, I put them through the chronographs. I do, I chronograph everything I shoot just so I know what the true speeds are, how to set up the scope, what I should expect for trajectory. But mine shot consistently at 509 feet per second uh, on a hunt that I used it on. I think it took, uh, it had a one foot per second variance after six shots. What did you shoot with it so far? uh, I shot uh, a nice whitetail buck. And I shot a huge mountain lion. Wow. Really? Yes. Congrats, man. That's pretty awesome. Where did you, I, I probably saw the pictures. You, you got so many things on your, your Instagram page. Where, where did you get the mountain lion from? In Alberta. We oh. have a, an opportunity here. Our, our, our lions are closely managed with cougar management zones. And to give you an example, in the zone that I was hunting, they allow the harvest of one female and two males, and then it's closed down. And the areas are huge. Mm-hmm. So uh, opportunities are out there to to go and hunt. It's funny, hunting mountain lions, how much you learn about deer and winter yards and how the deer survive our winters. It uh, gave me a really interesting view from a different predator's perspective. Oh, absolutely. And I know that a cat, uh, especially an um, adult cat, can take out what a de- one deer a week at least, right? Yeah, or much more if it's a female teaching cubs how to hunt. Ones. Or if you live in Alberta and it's minus 42, if you look at how a cat's face is designed, it's not like a coyote or a wolf that has a long jaw. Their their face is very short for, for strangulating their prey. They don't like eating and can't eat effectively on frozen meat. So if they kill something and it freezes, they leave it and go find something else. So they're, on, they're always on the hunt. Okay, I'm always on the hunt for good food. You know that, and I know that you can yep. do it. Um, I'm going to try to keep this segment short, but this is another one. Three things I get to answer first because I'm going to allow you to be a little bit more detailed. Three things every deer camp or deer hunter's house should have, and I'm going to say and this is for food processing. Mine are these. Number one, a meat pole or skinning shed with an electric winch is crucial i think an upright freezer that might be in addition to everything else you use but an upright freezer is perfect for sorting out various packages and a meat grinder if you don't have a meat grinder you can find a cheap one and i just looked this up before we went on air today the average price of hamburger beef hamburger in the united states is three dollars and 73 cents a pound so people always say well you don't save any money hunting well you shoot one small dough, 40 pounds of meat, that's 150 bucks a burger right there if you have a meat grinder to go with it. What, were, what would be the three crucials that you, that you would have? And I know that you have a pretty kick-ass meat processing center, but what are three go-tos that you have? Uh, some basic equipment. You, here's the, the key message. You don't need fancy things to be a home deer processor. So a good knife. A good bony knife is critical to do it effectively and efficiently. We don't want to leave a bunch of meat behind, so it allows you to get right down to the bone and take everything off cleanly. The sharpener to go with it is a, a natural. I would say also buy yourself some commercial meat tubs. They're food grade. They're easy to clean up. They're easy to store. You can mix sausage in it as well. Some of them come with a lid so that if you want to make sausage and put the spices in, you can set it aside in a fridge overnight. Let everything blend properly before you package it or case it. Why does? Let me just interrupt you. Why would it be? Why is it important that it has to be food grade? Why can't I just go get a Rubbermaid container and do it? Uh, the food grade has a special seal in the plastic to make sure that you're not going to pick up any dyes, uh, smell, scents. But it allows you to sanitize it and clean it properly afterwards. So you can use it time and time again. They're not expensive. I mean, if you watch for them on sale, you can get them for under ten dollars. You can buy them online. You can go to a local sporting goods store. You can go to a meat processing shop and sell supplies. They are a good investment. You know, when I started out, I used to use a cooler, but coolers aren't sanitary. You use them, things leak in them, the water comes out of everything. You know, you wipe them out, but not effectively. When you're processing game, I always tell people. Do it the same way that they would in a professional abattoir. Keep it clean, keep it safe, because you always want your meat to be the best quality possible. 
If you're serving family and friends, the last thing you want to do is make them sick. Not that the opportunities are great that that's going to happen. Why not show off, show your the best your best hand of cards? This is what I did. You wanted to feel proud about something? Present your meat in a way that it looks like it was done by a professional. People will notice it. It tastes better. It cooks evenly. There's a whole bunch of reasons. So, Okay, so it's a, a knife and a sharpener and some food-grade tubs. What would another thing be? Uh, another thing. Maybe a piece of equipment. Well, I'll be honest. One of our favorite pieces of equipment is a, uh, a Huber. So some people call them a Huber. Some people call them a, a tenderizer. But I have a professional grade one to make cutlets. So we make deer cutlets and goose cutlets and moose cutlets. And you can bread them with uh, cornmeal or pea meal and fry them up. You can put them in the barbecue. You can stuff them with things and roll them to make roulades and roulade like we did in camp one awesome. time. Awesome video that you uh, can watch. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, it, if you have trouble cooking things or if you have family members that don't like to eat things that aren't done well, you can cook cutlet well done. And because the machine breaks down those proteins, it's still going to be tender and delicious. So, you know, that's been a good one for me. Uh, you can buy mallets and pound them out. You can buy uh, different cubers or tenderizers that clamp onto the table and they have a hand crank to put them through. So there's lots of different options out there. That's an excellent, uh, uh, excellent tip. The, the cubers, um, like you said, you're using that not just on venison. You're using it on game birds and other things too, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of our favorite meals here is goose schnitzel. So, mm. I mean, a big old Canada goose, you take a goose press through there and run it out and you end up with a cutlet basically that's this big. So you cut it into a couple pieces and you can make beautiful big goose schnitzel and with gravy and some fresh parsley on top of it. Are you guys as hungry as I now? Now I want to go goose hunting. Because the, the first time I went goose hunting, I, I cooked that goose like you would anything else, and I could have made shoes out of that. It, was, it, w it wasn't it was that. But now the way that you describe it there, that sounds pretty darn good. Yeah, and you make a good point about uh, cooking things wrong. I always tell people, if you cook a beef steak or a pork chop wrong, it's going to be tough and not real palatable either. So learning how to cook wild game because it takes about half the time of domestic meat because there's no fat to eat through. Uh, is is really an art. One uh, okay. One one follow up on this. What is the most overlooked part of a deer, in your opinion, by most hunters, average guys? Uh, the most overlooked would either be the shanks or the neck. I was going to say the shank because you showed me. You're the one who showed me that. I yeah, never so cook, never cook shank like that until you showed me. I'm like, my gosh, that's brilliant. Yeah, and shank is. Uh, what we're talking about is a little forearm piece of meat that when you get in there and you try to trim that for burger, you're like, it's all sinew and cordy stuff. Yeah, you know, all the connective tissue in there um, hooks out. So it's not like it's a silver skin on a big muscle. When you slow cook it with a bit of moisture, which is what we call braising, it breaks down those connective tissues and turns all of them into collagen and gelatin which adds to the flavor of the dish and the shank becomes so tender it falls apart. So also buco is a recipe you can make. They make wonderful soup for making like a, a deer shank barley soup. Uh, mm. We make uh, all, all kinds of different things out of it. Some stews. We have a Indonesian dish we make where we put fresh garlic and ginger and uh, lemongrass and coconut milk and stuff and simmer it for hours and it is wonderful it's, it's another one that's very good so lots of things you can do anything that you would braise which is a slow cook with some liquid uh, keep your shanks do them that way you can leave them bone in in my case i never have enough freezer space so i always do them bone off but uh, you can do them whole cut them into pucks or whatever you want to, to serve them up but once you embrace them you never waste them that's that's a i need a t-shirt like that these guys the our whole tv crew when they're editing these videos they, you know they're taking early lunch because they're just like i can't take this he, the way he's making this stuff is just getting me way too hungry and that's what that's the way i look at it. i mean the other thing too now i had done it a little bit be, before i met you i really never utilized the rib meat the, the rib meat is oh my gosh 
it is that is so good you can't eat too much of it because you're gonna you're gonna kind of get you know a little bit ripped up if you if that's all you're eating is rib meat but that is so darn good yeah and you you've got a very easy technique for for doing it you just strip the meat out and keep it all in a bag and you put it in an pot pot or an instant pot cook it up fast it breaks down uh, most if there's fat in it it'll but as it cools, will rise to the top. You can actually skim the fat off in one piece and uh, just enjoy what's there for a rib meat. That would be my recommendation. Just cook it that way. Do not – the fat – it actually is delicious, but don't eat so much of that because it – if you have a stomach, a weak stomach, it's gonna it's gonna rip you up. Well, Brad, I yeah. think we're gonna have to we're gonna have to come back and we're gonna have to do an entire show on cooking because I know we do this a lot with the TV show, but s- some of the tips that Brad does, it's not it's not super complicated, but as you can tell by talking to Brad, he's very even headed and very. I can tell when you process things, you're doing it from a just a a, a standpoint where it's like this is practical. And it's it's easy. Anybody can do it. It's not fancy. It's not complicated. Brad, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it very much. I was gonna we're gonna have to ask you more about that soapstone fireplace because I I need one of those. Um, that looks like that's gonna keep keep that place nice and warm on a nice cold day like today. We had a stretch. It was minus fifty two to minus fifty five here this winter with the wind chill, and that went it burnt every day. My girls were saying, "Let's go get some wood." And they'd have their chairs in front of it. <laughs> That's where they'd have breakfast little, and stuff little, is in little, front of the little, fireplace. Little campfire there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brad, for joining us. We appreciate it. And we're going to cut it, cut you off here, but we're going to come back again and, and talk to you some more about more things, deer and deer hunting. Thanks, Dan. It was a pleasure. For Brad Fenson, I'm Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us for Deer Talk Now. Join us again next time.